Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Joined today by regular guest, friend of the pod, friend of mine, uh, Fred Katz of The Athletic and Katz and Shoot uh, of on Patreon.com. Hello, Fred. How are you? What a professional intro. Who you I'm become? very good at these. Not my first you've really, You've really polished yourself up. In the last hour and a half. I have. Um, so, Fred, um, we're going to get right to it today. Uh, I, I, We did this last year. We're going to do the exercise again that we did last year because it was a lot of fun. And you said a thing that was ridiculous, which we'll get to in a bit after I explain the rules of what we're going to do. Um, so John, this is this is this is I just want to say this is great hosting. Uh, you're really again. you're really laying out the points extremely well. As if as if someone who's never even listened to the podcast before would really be able to understand what's going on here. You're doing a well, great job. That's the goal. Uh, always. So what is it that we're doing here today? Here's what we're doing, folks. Um, Fred and I are going to go through the rosters for the New York Knickerbockers and the Philadelphia 76ers. And we are going to go through those rosters with the express purpose of um, drafting players. We're going to go back and forth, not snake, just back and forth. One, me, then him, then me, then him, so on and so forth. Or if he gets first pick, I don't know. I don't know who's going to get first pick. Might be Fred that gets first pick. We'll see. Um, And we're going to draft the players in order in terms of who we think will have the biggest impact on this series that is about to uh, unfold starting on Saturday, of course, at six o'clock, which, by the way, you could uh, come to T-Squared Social where we're doing a watch party um, on 42nd Street. So come come check that out. Uh, The one thing that we want to make sure uh, is clear before we get to drafting, unlike last year where we drafted kind of uh, the idealized versions of players. Uh, we are taking into account for this draft how players exist as they are right now, today. It's Thursday, April 18th. Uh, so if a guy is hurt, uh, if a guy is coming back from injury, if a guy hasn't really looked like himself, or in the case of, like, for instance, a DeAnthony Melton, who we don't think is even going to play in this series because he didn't play in the playing game and he's played like five games in the last three months. Um, that all is going to be factored in and um, we're going to go through this and we're going to see what our uh, opinions are about who are the players that are going to make a big impact on who wins the series. Fred, did I miss anything? No, that was very professional. I wonder if the listeners can tell that we got in trouble. <laughs> We would never get in trouble. Who would get us in trouble? What trouble like might you be alluding to, Fred Katz of The Athletic, whose username for some reason says number one overall pick Dean Wade. What might that be referencing? John? Oh, that's right. I was so professional. I forgot the bit. Uh, it's not a bit. It's just Fred did something very stupid last year when he said. <laughs> and the, on the episode last year, we're going to have to record this a third time. On the episode that we did last year about the Cavs, <laughs> before the Cavs series, um, Fred picked Dean Wade. I forget what he picked up. He picked him high, higher than he probably should have. Before RJ Barrett, um, that was the key because he felt sure, more secured. I don't want to put words in Fred's mouth that Dean Wade, two way player, good shooter, multi positional, you know, wing defender. Uh, would have a positive impact on that series. And, um, you know, it turned out to maybe that that, that wasn't uh, the case. Uh, so we're going to see if, D- if if Fred slash Dean Wade is going to make the same error this time around. I don't think it was an error for what it's worth. I, hmm. You were just ahead of think, the curve. Uh, I think we're just waiting on the payoff. Long-term investment. You know? Could you, we haven't seen the returns yet, but we will. Yeah. Could day. you imagine if D? I'm, I'm being dead serious. Could you imagine if Dean Wade was like came up massive in the Magic series that the Cavs have? Yeah, I've imagined it many times. <laughs> I've imagined it, and I've imagined the texts that I would send to our group chat, the super chats that I would pay for my whole paychecks worth. <laughs> just to the post game show, just so I could have Dean Wade's line read live on the air. 
on Nick's uh, film school post game show. I would do it with much gusto. Uh, all right, Andrew, who's picking first here? Would you like me to decide the draft order if I could find my deck of cards? Or would you like uh, me to just do what we did this morning with Age Before Beauty? I I don't I don't know. I, I kinda I, I kinda like the random the randomness of it. Okay then. For those of you that are tuning in for the very first time for one of our drafts. Probably uh, so what we like to do here at Nick's Film School is the high convoluted lottery system of high card draw. So I have a deck of playing cards in front of me. I promise you it is not a, a, a fixed deck of cards, Fred, although maybe it might be in your favor. So who knows if it is. That is a shuffle that I just did. Um, the cards kind of went everywhere. So I'm going to stall a little bit because it was not the greatest of shuffles. Just pick two cards. Doesn't need first a- things first. You don't have to shuffle it. We will go with John Macri. Your card is a ace. All right. So let's see. This is the pretty important second card, Fred. That's usually how high card draw Wait, works. The is ace card. high or low? High. Ace is high. Ace is high. Ace isn't low. It's not a one. Ace is no. always high when we do this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm ace not is high. Oh. Fred, your well, card is a know. six. Jonathan Macri, you have the first pick in this year's annual playoff series opponent draft, which I'm realizing now we didn't do for the Heat series, which we should make that a thing. Whoever the Knicks play in the second round, um, we should. If the Knicks John, make John it through gets, the second round, John My bad. gets. Uh, right. Well, they might John, lose. You take, you take they might lose Wade. in the play in, Fred. So. <laughs> just a logistical question. Is Dean Wade eligible in this draft? Because he would obviously be my first pick. He's encouraged. But you get if you take Dean Wade, you get two, two picks, and then I'll trade for Dean Wade. I'll give you if we do this draft again for the second round, I'll trade you my first round pick from that draft for what, Dean Wade. When's like the last? I don't know if you play fantasy football. I still do, even though I don't watch football anymore. When's the last like football like fantasy player who you would like give up like your whole draft to get? Like probably maybe was it is it like Tomlinson back in the day? I don't. I was just gonna say like Damian Tomlinson, which really shows my my. How dated my my football knowledge and my fantasy football? You and me both. I don't know, Priest Holmes yeah. is that more dated than Tomlinson or less dated? <laughs> Priest Holmes is more dated. Is more because dated. Ladanian Tomlinson broke Priest Holmes' touchdown record. There you go. Okay. Wow, good, good good job by you. Um, Two thousand four. That's that's impre- I'm impressed. Yeah, I'm sufficiently impressed. Okay. Um, I guess the only question I have is is it is it controversial in any way? Given what you said about we're taking players as they are, not as their respective fan bases maybe wish them to be, is it controversial in any way for me to take Jalen Brunson here? I'm, I'm taking Jalen Brunson, but is that controversial? No, n- no, it's not controversial. I think you could argue not taking Jalen Brunson, but I would take him number one too. He's he is he is the sure thing. Uh-uh. You know. Like, yeah. you know, Jalen Brownson is going to come out and his fingerprints are going to be all over every single thing that the Knicks do and every single thing that the Sixers try to prevent the Knicks from doing. So maybe the maybe the better way to ask the question, we don't have to spend that, that much time on Jalen Brunson because again, like we know where Jalen Brunson is. If Jay, is there a world? I, well, no, I, of course, there's going to be a world, but like. If if we finish the series and Jalen Brunson has been the best player in the series, I get there are I'm sure there are scenarios where the Knicks could lose that series. I, I I'm struggling to envision what those scenarios would be, other than like injury and like I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what I was doing at my big board for this, and the majority of the guys in my top ten are Knicks. And the thing that Philly has, if you just like one-to-one comparison, the thing that Philly has going for them is they have the reigning MVP. And if he plays like the reigning MVP, then he can win you a series against basically anyone because he can completely control the game on both sides of the floor, not just as a 35 point score. He can completely take away the paint. Uh, But I think, I think Brunson is absolutely going to be that. I think every single thing that Philly does is going to have Brunson in mind. I'm really curious what they do with their defensive matchups in their starting lineup. Me too. Like I was just talking about this. I just recorded an episode of my podcast, Cats and Shoot. And one thing that I mentioned on there is like, consider me the least surprised person in the world. Nick Nurse wants the 
just throw stuff at the wall all the time defensively. Like consider me the least surprised person in the world if Philly just comes out in game one and Embiid is guarding Josh Hart right off the bat. And you just have Embiid sagging off of Josh Hart. And the reason that you're doing that is not just because Hart can't shoot or doesn't want to shoot. It's not his preference. It's also because maybe you want to have an extra aggressive pick and roll coverage against Jalen Brunson. And he wants to bring over Isaiah Hartenstein and pick and rolls. And Embiid is the best when you can keep him around the paint. So you can have him roam roam off of Hart and you maybe have Tobias Harris or something on Hartenstein. And you can send Harris to the level of the screen. You can blitz with Harris. You can try all these different things with Tobias Harris that you wouldn't necessarily do with Embiid, especially if he's hampered. That's all an effect of Jalen Brunson. That is all an effect of Jalen Brunson. They're going to throw every single kind of defensive coverage you could possibly imagine at Brunson. And that that's what we're talking about here. Who's going to impact the series the most? That's that's yeah. what we're that's what we're talking about. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. So uh easy easy first pick. Um I I mean I have a guess of where you would go with this, but I'm I'm curious. So what do you got, Fred? Yeah, easy second pick. Easy second I, I, pick. It's, I think it's it's Joel, it's Joel Embiid. If okay. if if Embiid is healthy, he's the easy first pick. If he yes. if he looked like 100% of himself, and that's not a slight on Brunson, Embiid was having the best per minute scoring season of all time, including the Wilt 50 point per game season before he got hurt. Uh, and he's doing it while walling off the paint, while having this wonderful triple handoff and pick and roll chemistry with Tyrese Maxey. Philadelphia is 31 and 8 when Embiid's in the lineup. They're under 500 when he's out. They're plus 10 per 100 possessions when he's on the court. Mm-hmm. Like their 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 best lineups have him. They're at their best when he's there, even if he's 85. percent He is a freaking monster. He played yeah. by his standards in that playing game against the Heat. By his standards, he played like crap. Yeah, he. He took over in the in the fourth quarter, hit some threes, had that nice pass down low to Batum. But by his standards, he played like crap in that game. And he had 23, 15, and six. Yep. And how the Knicks, I think the most interesting thing in this series is going to be how the Knicks guard him. They, well, you wrote about it they, today. That's why I wrote about it. And you did. I write about what phenomenal, I think is interesting. And you did a phenomenal job writing about it. In particular, I love that you led the story off with a guy who is probably, I would guess, not going to get the primary assignment on Embiid most of the time, but with the guy who could arguably make the biggest impact in terms of preventing Embiid from going off, and that's obviously OJ Anunoby. I thought you were going to say you love how I led the story off by using the word "chant" in a lead because. I, uh, I, I did because not like actually four, pick up on that. Now I'm going to go back. Because like that. four people texted me about that. They were like, you're really using chant in a lead? Like it got texted to my, to a group chat them in with a bunch of other writers. And they're like, if one, if you told me one person in here used chant in a lead, I would need one guess to get it correct. So I did use chant in a lead. And you know what? I'm thrilled about it. I wrote that thing at 1.30 in the morning after watching Embiid film and in, in that play-in game and I was like, you know what? Screw it. I stay up late. I get to put chant in the lead. And, I'm and it's not just it. in the lead. It's the third. Wo- I mean, arguably the second word, if you consider OJ and Obi to be one word, OJ and Obi chant ruin the mystery. That's fantastic. Hey, that makes you want to read. Hey, I mean, I, I kept reading. <laughs> what the hell is the mystery? Guess what? You're not going to find out. OJ and Obi won't ruin it. Because he shan't ruin it. Um, he shan't ruin it. I was going to uh, ask. <laughs> what? Yeah. No, but I, I, I'm i really intrigued to see how the Knicks guard and beat. Absolutely. And, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I've already written about it and I've talked about it on my pod and I don't want to oversaturate people with the same stuff. But the Knicks are very committed to their shell. That's how Tom, Th- how Tom Thibodeau defenses play. They're very committed to their shell. They believe that your your first, your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth responsibility is to the man who you're supposed to guard. And traditionally, they're not very aggressive in wanting to double and beat. They don't want to double and beat. 
And that puts a lot of pressure on Isaiah Hartenstein. And it might put a lot of pressure on Mitchell Robinson. And Embiid played on only one game against the Knicks this year. And Hartenstein was phenomenal in that game on both sides. My goodness, he was amazing. He, he had some best points game of the and, year. Yeah. I, that, that's a good call. The one in Sacramento, he was awesome. I mean, he's had uh, two. I mean, Wilson, I'm, I have a feeling his name is going to come up on the sooner side rather than later, but he's had a lot of those games. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, guy, defensively, he was unbelievable. Basically, guarding Embiid one on one the whole time. The only time the Knicks were sending help in that game is if Embiid got low post positioning before the catch. And then the Knicks come and they send a double team. Otherwise, it's like Isaiah Hartenstein, you go work one on one on Embiid. And. If we're talking about impact, the way Embiid can really impact the Knicks is because really what great players do, the way they impact the game is they get you to do things that you don't want to do. The Knicks don't want to double Embiid. But if Embiid wrecks Hartenstein, either because he's posting him up or because he gets him in foul trouble or because he's, he's just working so well with Maxi and Maxi's getting him the ball. Or because he's doing his work before the catch really well. Now he's catching the ball every time with a foot in the paint. Mm. Now the Knicks are doubling. If Embiid just wrecks Hartenstein, and I imagine that at some point he will. He might not do it for the whole series. Hartenstein yeah. might be great against him in the series. But this is Joel freaking Embiid. He averages 35 points a game. At some point, I don't care how good you are. I don't care if you're the best defensive center of all time. He's going to wreck you because that's what great players do. And that's his impact. How the Knicks change, if the Knicks change, how they guard him. Uh, you know, we saw like like Jimmy Butler wasn't very good in that Miami series last year, right? Even though playoff Jimmy is a thing, but he was not amazing in that series. But I think there's a real good argument that he impacted that series more than anybody else because that whole freaking time, Tibbs is like double Jimmy, double Jimmy. Trap Jimmy on pick and rolls, got the Knicks out of what they really want to do. And it put them in a lot of scramble situations. Yes. And even if Embiid, if Embiid can just get the Knicks out of what they want to do, that's that's a good victory for Philly. So the only pushback I'm going to give you on that being the most interesting thing of the series, and I agree with everything that you said about like like what kind of what to look for and the different approaches they could have and how that might impact Hardenstein is we have seen the Knicks play three playoff series under Tom Thibodeau. They have been in the, I would argue in the Atlanta series, they were excellent. The Cavs series, I don't think you could have a better defensive series. And despite the fact that yes, the he got him scrambling a few times and definitely caught him a few times. I think they were pretty darn good defensively in the Miami series. I think they're, is a baseline of defensive competence that we are going, the Knicks are going to show. And, and to me, my greater concern is on the offensive end, because as we saw again, last year, third best offense tied for third best offense in the league. Didn't matter. Like this team had some real freaking problems in the postseason. Now is this team perhaps better equipped than that team to solve those problems? I, we'll, we'll, we'll say that because we're going to keep moving along. Well, let me let me say one yeah, thing. Sure. Not only do I totally agree with you, the reason I think it's the most interesting is because I agree with you. This is an awesome defense okay. who no. does what it wants to do really well. Yeah. Against an awesome player who does what he wants to do really well. Yeah. And someone is going to have to relinquish what they do. Someone is not going to be able to do what they want well, to do at the level that they are so often able to do it. And someone is going to have to adjust their style. And that's either going to mean one of the best, toughest, most fundamentally sound, intelligent, well-built defenses in the league having to change things around, or the reigning MVP being like, dude, I'm overwhelmed. And that to me is super interesting. For what it's worth, sure. Tibbs' process on when he wants to change coverages are he asks, is it being executed with effort? Yeah. If it's being executed with effort, he moves on to the next one, which is, is it being executed properly? Yeah. And if it's being executed properly, then he says, is the coverage the wrong coverage? So he's got to go through those two things. If the Knicks 
are running a certain coverage and Tibbs thinks it's the right coverage, but it's difficult to run, whatever it might be. I don't know what they're going to do. We'll see. I can guess, but I don't know. And it's difficult to do. And they're just not executing it maybe at 100%. Maybe they're executing it at 85%. Maybe they're, they're, yeah. they're B plus and B plus isn't good enough against Joel Embiid. I don't know if Tibbs is going to change stuff because he might be like, you need to execute it at A plus, not B plus. Uh, I, I just, it, the chess match is really interesting. Nick Nurse is really creative. Tibbs has a reputation for being rigid, but I, I thought he was not rigid at all, really, during the playoff run last year. I thought he made a lot of adjustments, a lot of schematical changes. I thought he had a, a good playoff run last year. I, I, I enjoy the chess match. Okay. Uh, I have to make a pick here. This is who we think will have the biggest impact on the series. This is tough for me because my head, my head is telling me I should say the name of the guy who's probably going to finish, as I've said a few times recently, 19th, 20th, probably in all NBA voting. And then, but there's another part of me that thinks, actually, I think that you could really make, I think you could make an argument for a few different Knicks here. The most obvious one would be for me, at least OJ Ananobi. Because I think, because I, I, I'm of all the Knicks, because I think that this series is going to be won or lost on offense for the Knicks. And I'm pretty, I don't have a lot of wondering about what OG Ananobi is going to do on offense. I feel pretty like we, I, he's like the most, like you kind of know what you're going to get from him on the offensive side of the ball sort of player for the Knicks. And like, you're never going to get. Like, I don't see any world, like, are the Knicks winning a game, even one game in the series with a, where OJ and Obi wins it for them on offense? Like, I don't think he's that, maybe, who knows? He's a gifted player. I don't know if we're getting that. Defensively is another story, but again, I, I think, and, but listen, if he is a wrecker on defense to the, to his, to the point that he is capable of, he should be the pick here. Especially when, I, I'm sorry, I'm talking this out, especially when the other guy, Tyrese Maxey, for as brilliant an offensive player as he is, and he is a brilliant offensive player in a lot of ways, gives you nothing. Well, maybe not nothing. He gives you not very much on the other end. Um, all right, I'll I'll let I'll let the heart I'll let the heart win this one out. I will go with OG and Obi, uh, but very conflicted uh, choice for me. I understand your logic. Number four, I, I, I'm totally taking Maxi. Oh, I, duh! I I would have I would have taken Maxi number three. I know you would. I get I get still, where you're coming from. Yeah, but it's just like it. Like OG's archetype is so valuable. Yeah, and he's so important against a team like Philadelphia. Chances are he's going to be guarding Maxi. Honestly, what's 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 great, John, is this is actually going to be solved right before our eyes. Because <laughs> yes, OG probably. is probably going to spend most of his time on Maxi, yeah. and if OG just shuts off his water, then yeah. you're going to be like, "Wow, OG had the biggest impact." And if Maxi has himself a hell of a series, we're going to be like, "Oh, it was Maxi," and that's yeah. that. They're just no, they're going to be going head to head, and and OG will guard a number of guys. I think there will be times where we'll see him on Tobias Harris. I think he's going to switch in emergency situations onto a ton of different players. Uh, maybe not in emergency situations onto other players. The coverage will just be switched. So I'm sure they'll they'll move him around and slide him around. But I do think he's going to spend most of his time with his primary assignment as, as Maxi. To me, it's just like one dude is a, a really good 26-point scorer. And sometimes, I don't know, sometimes we overthink things and we just take Dean Wade in this draft. <laughs> And, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. You know, I don't want to be the guy that takes Dean Wade. So I'm just going to be like, Hey, this is a guy who we can all agree is just a really good player who averages 26 points a game is a really good scorer, pushes pace, yep. has great chemistry with Embiid. By the way, if the Knicks are playing individual defense, great on Embiid. And if they are making Embiid's life difficult in one-on-one -on -one situations, Max, he's the guy who's got to open them up. Maxi's the guy yes. who's going to run dribble handoffs with. He's going to run yep. pick and rolls with. They run dribble handoffs where Maxi hands it off to Embiid. They run them where Embiid hands them off to Maxi. Like they, 
they have really good chemistry together and it's Maxi's job to get him open. He's done a, a, a good job of that this year. He did a really good job of that before Embiid suffered the injury. They, they were off to just a roaring start. Was there a better uh, two men? Was there a better two man combination in the league this year when Embiid was healthy? Are are you referencing an analytic, or are you just asking for my personal opinion? No, no, your personal opinion. Yeah, my personal opinion is that Jokic and Jamal Murray is number one. Oh, d- d- okay, d- yes, that's correct. But Maxi and Embiid's right up there. They're right. Okay, it's, so they're in conversation for number two. Yeah, yeah, they're right up there. But I mean, Jokic and Murray are my heart. Just just hits me in the heart. Yoko Murray. They just they're, oh they're still my it's the most beautiful. Still my pick to win the title this year. And it's that, gorgeous that basketball. Oh, it's, Absolutely I mean, well, gorgeous basketball. Jokic is um other than Isaiah Hartenstein and, and Deuce McBride. Who who funny enough, they've played together more and more, and I feel like they've connected less and less. What is going on with that? I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> that is true. You know, I it's think strange. it is. I think I know. I think Deuce is hunting threes more. And he's not well, as, cutting as, as much. And I, I just think he's not he's not really trying that back cut as much. But you're right. Because Hartenstein finds him on that back cut all the time. He hasn't done it in a minute. No. Um, he's finding Brunson on that a lot though now. Well, listen, I'll take that. Um, okay. All right. You all got right. number five. Yeah. So the uh, first four picks in some order were always going to be, I think, the first four picks in some order. Now, here's the series, right? I, I mean, look, bro, could Brunson take a take a dump and, and have a terrible series. Hey, sure. Anything's possible. But like, I think Gro- gross, gross expression. Gross. Uh, oh yeah. Because you're so mature. <laughs> so um, you know, it's funny. I'm so immature. You know what? You know what? Andrew just hates about having me on the podcast. There's only one for thing. those who see, for those who see the visual, like I, just move. Yeah, but I, I do I have that too. The most <laughs> horrific ADHD, and I'm leaning. John, it's not like as I'm bad doing as my Oh, oh no, 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 I can't, yeah. I can't sit still. I hold my microphone. Like, John, your mic is in place in one spot. You have to speak. You have to speak yes. right here the whole time, and you're good. Yeah. I am I'm dynamic. I'm, Leaves the shot. Yep. Yep. I'm, yes. I'm Clay Thompson coming around to screen. Oh, that's a great comp. All over the place. I thought you were okay. going to say a, a current day version of a Clay Thompson jump shot, like where the ball ends up, you know? Oh, well, that's mean. That's unfortunate. That was, that was that's, a cold that's, war. That's, that's <laughs> too mean. Is he here? Let, <laughs> what I was what I was getting at, like you know, Embiid, if you know he could he could come up big and he could look a lot better than he's than he's looked, and like OG is going to do his thing, Max is going to do their thing or his thing. I I suspect a, a goodly portion of the next segment of guys drafted will be Knicks, and if those guys that are about to get drafted all play good to very good or like good ish to very good again I, I don't i find it very hard to see a world where the knicks lose this series again unless Embiid just like has the one of the best series that a, that a player is capable of having and maxi's right there with him um and if some of the players that we're about to name their impact is um not as much as you would would like to see if you're a Knicks fan then it's it might be a very different series um all right. So, which one of those Knicks am I going to take here? Uh, between two, I really could be between three, but I'm between two. I'm going to go with Divincenzo. I'm going to go with Divincenzo, and it's going to be, um, a vote of confidence in two things. One, the lesser important of the two things for me, because the Knicks do have OG and Obi, is I do think he's going to get the Maxi assignment a fair bit of time. And can he at least can he at least make Maxi like can he put some pressure there on him? Like nobody's asking you to shut Tyrese Maxi down. You're not going to shut Tyrese Maxi down. It's not going to happen. I don't think anyone can shut Tyrese Maxi down. Um, although Deuce McBride, I'm sure, is, is going to try when he gets his opportunity. 
But more importantly than that, I have a, I just cannot imagine this offense having watched it all year, but specifically since June or since uh, January 27th. I just can't imagine how this offense is supposed to function at any, with any modicum of success. If not that even Chenzo is not Clay Thompson, like 90, 90, whatever. Well, no, he, I don't want to give him a percent of like Pete Clay Thompson because Clay Thompson could have been a top 75 player of all time. And that's, he's, he's one of one as a shooter. But not that even Chenzo was one of the five to 10 most impactful shooters in the league this year. I just can't imagine the Knicks without that, what they would do if he was not doing the thing that he did in the way that he did it with the volume, with the, uh, it doesn't matter if I miss six in a row, I'm taking the seventh. If I miss seven in a row, I'm taking the eighth. They need that. It is their lifeblood because there's not anyone else that could do that. That is going to do that in that way. I guess other than maybe do pride who has played 19 playoff minutes in his life, you know, um, I'm going to take Steven Chenzo. Maybe a controversial pick, but that's what I'm going with. I think that totally makes sense. And and he he struggled in Golden State's playoff run last year too. Yes, he did. So he's got he's got a little finished chip strong. on his shoulder. The last game. Is, I, mean, I, I know it's the last game, but it's one game. But he finished strong. Okay. Yeah, he's got a little chip on his shoulder. Uh, yeah, I I had Dante at number five on my. Oh, board. okay. There you go. So I'm into it. And I agree. It was tough. These next guys are kind of jumbled. Uh, number are. six, I'm going to go Isaiah Hartenstein. That was the other you know, guy. I, That's it. Yeah, I talked I talked about the defense. Obviously, he's going to be so important guarding Embiid, but it's not just that. Depending on how the Sixers go against Brunson, at some point, they're going to be trapping. And at some mm-hmm. point, the Knicks are going to have to Send Hartner, they're going to send Hartnerstein there, and he's going to have to be the guy who breaks the trap. And he's been so good in that role. One of the things I'm really curious to see is with Hartenstein presumably playing more than, you know, not really dealing with the minutes restriction anymore come the playoffs. And I don't expect that he will. I'm really interested to see how Tibbs uses him because we saw him do well when Tibbs staggered him with that bench lineup that had Bogey and DiVincenzo in it, along with McBride. And he was really good in that. And it was one way the Knicks were kind of able to sustain the game. It kind of worked, that lineup, at the end of the year. It was one way they were kind of able to sustain the game in non-Brunson time. But separating him from Brunson means they're not playing him as much with Brunson, which means that Mitchell Robinson is oft going to be your screen setter. Or maybe you're doing guard-to-guard screens and Mitch is down low, and his defender is going to be right there to meet people in the paint. Maybe. Joel Embiid, playing exactly how you want. Uh, I'm really interested to see how they do it. I think Embiid would probably have a tougher time with Hartenstein than he will with Mitchell Robinson, just because Embiid is at his best when he can play a drop. And he can more comfortably do that in a Mitchell Robinson pick and roll. Whereas with Hartenstein, Hartenstein, like... Like Hartenstein's 17 points in that game, it was because he just kept hitting him with floater, 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 floater. And he's been on a roll with that floater lately. He can make passes out of the pocket too. So you kind of have to press up on him more. He's just been really good lately. I mean, he's been really good all year, but he's he's really hit a whole other level in the last month or so. I, I, I think he's going to be really important for them in this series in just about every way. We've had this conversation offline. We have probably had it on the pod, but like the the, do you split the baby and separate Hartenstein from Brunson to try to bolster those bench units, or do you trust what else you got? And like, look, I know the playoffs are a different animal, and like you could to a certain extent throw some like your regular season data in the trash, but you look at. I mean, I know you've looked at them. The numbers when you add Hartenstein to like the next core group, and then when you take them away, and it's. I don't think people realize this is night and fucking day. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm becoming, I, I, and I've been the proponent of like, man, I kind of like hard. The, those bench shooters a lot more with Harnstein. And then today, you know, you were there and it's, it's a 30, he could go above 30 minutes, but I, I, I mean, what do you expect them to push him to? They're, they're not going to push him that much. more. I don't right? know for, for what it's worth. He said today he could go for more than 30. 
But that's that's because I I specifically was like, are you going to be able to go for more than thirty in the playoffs? You okay? All right. So I I I phrased it that way because before it was like that was the cutoff. Yeah. Like he went for thirty three in that one game, and they were like, that's too many. Yeah. And 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 they the cutoff was really thirty before it was around twenty five twenty six, and and lately he'd been playing in the high twenties and yeah. and hit thirty a couple of times. And so I asked him if he'd be able to go for more than 30. And he was like, yeah. So I don't, I, I don't know. I could have probably phrased that in a way that might've gotten a better answer, no. but I've asked everybody else the question. I've asked Tibbs the question. Tibbs is like, I don't know. It's all medical. He literally right? said, I don't know. I was like, I don't know. So he just doesn't want it out there. So I'm like, maybe if I just ask it in a really specific way, then I'll yeah. at least get an answer. So, well, well, I mean, he's he's just he's, it's a great pick. He's incredibly valuable what they do. OK, um, that brings it to me. I will take my X factor in this series, and that is Josh Hart. Um, I, I'll say it yet again. If Josh Hart has a great series and we're t- looking back and be like, man, that was that, that series that Josh Hart's fingerprints all over it. I don't think there's any way the Knicks lose this thing. But I also think that there could be a world where it's like, man, hard. It's and I, I would feel the worst about saying this, but like, I, there is a surely there is a world where like, man, heart, heart really just he killed not that he killed them, but if he is if he does the thing on offense where he's hesitant and he doesn't shoot and he doesn't move right away when he gets the ball and he doesn't shoot on top of that, that's death, and that would be really unfortunate. And uh, he needs to just be decisive and he needs to get himself involved as he is want to do. And he needs to play with confidence, as you talked about last time you were on the show um, about or when I was on your show, whatever it was. It, it's confidence for him. It is confidence for him. That's why I think the idea of like throwing and beat on him and letting him beat Rome is so Fuck, interesting. Sure. Why not? For Philly, you know, just like get get in his head while you do all of the other stuff that you can get schematically from it, you know? I, that's, that's a good one. I, I'm happy that my number seven guy on my board, I'm going to get with my number eight pick. So I'm going to take Tobias Harris. Oh, look and at I'm, you. And I'm going to get booed out of the gym by every single 76ers person who might be listening to this, because if you say anything nice about Tobias Harris, they will excoriate you in <laughs> Philadelphia. However, look, he had a very underwhelming season. Yeah. He had a very underwhelming season. With him beat out, part of the reason why they struggled so much because you kind of expect Harris to shoulder some of the load, and it basically just all fell on Maxi, and he couldn't handle all of that. And you kind of expect Harris to shoulder some of the load, and he basically still was just like quarter threes, some transition, occasional bucket he'll create for himself, and that's about it. He's still a good scorer and a good shooter. He can still get hot and win you a game. He's still big enough to where you can play him in any spot. He's still not going to be played off the floor. You know, at this point, we're kind of in a position where everybody who we're going to say from this point out, (sighs) this is why I took Dane Wade, by the way. (laughs) Because in a playoff series, yeah. If you have at least one massive flaw that will be picked at yes. to no end, and you might not be played off the floor, that's an overused phrase. People are like, oh, you think they're going to play Rudy Gobert off the floor like in every playoffs? Rudy Gobert doesn't get played off the floor in the playoffs. They keep him in. What are you talking about? People are like, oh, what about that time where the Clippers just kept getting corner threes? It's like, yeah, they kept getting corner threes because they left Rudy Gobert in. He wasn't played off the floor. What are you talking about? Even though actually it wasn't really Gobert. It wasn't Gobert. Gobert. Perimeter defenders sucked and everybody wanted to blame it on Rudy Gobert because he's always the scapegoat. But so anyway, a tangent. Who would have thought? Never happened on this show before. (laughs) Tobias Harris's big flaw is that he's just not enough. It's like, it's not, it's not, it's not enough. But there's not the huge exploitable flaw that could make him really difficult to play. That that's could pop up call. as a wart for his team. Uh, that's, that's a great With call. Hart, 
it's the shooting with Kelly Oubre, even though he's had a much better passing season than he ever has before, it could be the tunnel vision, or it could be that he could get really cold with a jump shot with Batum. It could be that even though he's a really reliable, solid role player, I, I would say maybe he's the closest thing to this thing that we're describing of just like, he's very mendable. He's just like not young anymore. Yeah. He's just not young anymore. He's with Mitchell Robinson, talented. it's the obvious stuff. With Kyle Lowry, it's that the offense can go away. With Buddy Heald, it's the defense. With Bogdanovich, it's the defense. With Deuce McBride, it's that it's his first time playing in the damn playoffs. And we don't know how that's going to go. And so, like, I just I feel good about taking guys who are well rounded. And that's how I ended up with Dean Wade at around this point in the draft last year. And it worked out uh, great. But I think <laughs> Tobias Harris is a better player than Dean Wade. I'll go out on the limb and just say that. I think I agree with you. Um, I will look, I I I think it's your your logic is sound. Um, Tobias Harris for as like awful a season as he had, 17 and a half points, almost 50% shooting overall, 35% from three. You know, it's like and the guys can hold his own on defense. Um, although he'll, I'm sure Brunson would test that one-on-one matchup if he, if he gets it. Okay. Um, this, this is actually very easy for me. I, I might've taken Brunson, this guy John, yeah. John Brunson tests like drew holiday. Yes. <laughs> I think I'll test Tobias Harris. I think so too. Uh, I would have taken this guy at eight. Uh, I'm going to take Kelly Oubre jr. Um, because I have just been really impressed with his one-on-one defense on Jalen Brunson. I think he fights. I think there's a toughness to him. I think he's one of those guys that he's like, he's had a really interesting career, you know, I mean, drafted by the, uh, your, your, your formerly beloved Washington Wizards. I covered and him. You, you did cover him. What do you think of him? What do you think about Kelly Ray Jr.? What's your, give me a couple I think he's thoughts. In, I think he's a much better player now than he was when I covered him. But, well, I mean, he was—he only came out after his freshman year at Kansas, and he was like the 14th pick in the draft and thrown right in, uh, or 15th pick, I think. Um, and uh, then the Suns—he went to was it the Suns, then the Warriors, or the Warriors and the Suns? Suns, then the Warriors. Suns and the Warriors. Because like, he was—he was in—he was in the uh, the the Marshawn Dylan Brooks oh, trade God. fiasco. I forget that. So Suns. They didn't really want him. Warriors, they didn't really want him. Hornets, nobody paid attention to him, but he was averaging 20 points a game, just chucking it up. And now he's on the Sixers team and he's like, he's had a journey. And like, I think it's easy to like say his name and think about like the, you know, like your, your Javal McGee type, not in terms of player type, but like the, the guy who's going to like do the stupid thing in the big moment or whatever. I don't think that's Kelly Oubre Jr. I think Kelly Oubre Jr. is good. Shooting 31% from three, which is not great. Um, but he the, the other thing about him is like you said, he could get tunnel vision, but he could that's because he's a gifted scorer. Um, so yeah, that he's gonna be my my next pick here. Yeah. That makes sense. He's gotten much better. He's had a really good year. I think really even is. though the counting numbers don't show it, the efficiency numbers don't even really show it. I think he's like in a like a 50% effective field goal percentage guy. And he's been higher than that in his career. I think there's an argument. This is his best season that like he's impacting winning in a sure. way yeah. that he hasn't before. Yeah. He's been, he's been good for them. And I think he's, I agree. I think he's a better defender than he's ever been. And on yeah. that note, I'm going to take Batum. I think that's the correct pick. Man, was he awesome in that Miami game? Well, they might they don't they don't win the game if he's not awesome. No, they don't. He was awesome in that game, and not just because he hit six threes. I thought he played a just fabulous defensive game. Yeah. He for a guy who's at his age, and I bet if you line him up in a cone drill, he's gonna yeah. lose to the vast majority of NBA perimeter players and the fact that he can guard Tyler hero and Tyler hero can run a pick and roll. Batum can evade the pick and roll hero can think he's open, pull up from three. And this happened in the game last night and Batum can come from behind him and get a hand into his shot and, and get a fingertip on the shot. 
that's just like fundamentally the way he maneuvers. I just think he's a extremely solid player. He wins your games. Like drains corner threes. He's just yeah, he's just a winning player. He's just yeah. he's just a winning he's a, winning five player. points a game. He, he he's a winning like it, that's all that he's he's a winning player. He just makes winning plays. Um I don't have anything to say. It's, I think that's a really good pick. Yeah. I mean, look, their their best lineup, their best four man combo <laughs> with Embiid, Maxi, Harris. It's those guys in Batum. Yeah. Plus 22 per 100 possessions. I've said it on 18 podcasts so far. Doesn't make it any less true. All right. Um, and, and he's it, at some point, he's going to be on Bronson. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's funny. Like we talked about, we started the show talking about, well, how often are the Knicks just going to challenge Hardenstein to guard and beat one on one and survive that? Like, the Sixers have some guys that could do that with Brunson and Ubre and Batum, and you could argue maybe. Hmm. Well, let's see who let's see who gets drafted next. Um, Batum Batum's a really interesting Brunson defender too, because like normally when you say you're going to put length on an All Star point guard, it's normally athletic length. Yes, and Batum gives you length, and normally it's because the All Star point guard is like, you know, I don't know Derek Rose or some something. You know, yeah. it's it's this explosive athlete yeah. and Brunson's athleticism comes in a very different kind of way, yep. comes in his shiftiness and the way that you effectively guard Brunson, you know, in terms of just like one-on-one matchups is you don't bite on his fakes and you don't stray in the wrong direction when you think he's going somewhere, but he's actually not going there. And now you've given him the escape valve and he can step through and shoot his little rinky dink seven foot floater and it's going to go in. And Batum is very smart. Very smart. He's been doing this a long time. Extremely high IQ basketball player in every way possible. He's an interesting Brunson defender. Yes. Um, So we've taken 10 players, five Knicks, five Sixers. None of the players that we've taken yet are the guy who was arguably the best player in the next first round series last year, who you already mentioned. And he is returning from injury. He's in the process of still getting back to himself. I don't know where he is. I thought you phrased it perfectly in your piece today where he is saying that he has shown flashes. I think that was very apt. And then he played seven minutes in their last game um, for an injury that we don't really know what it is, but according to Mitch Robinson, he's fine. So I, I don't know what to say. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was the ankle. I assumed as much, but like it just, well, it's the next with injury stuff. Um, they said it was precautionary huh. and he's been practicing in full this week. So mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, I'm I'm being really hopeful here. I'll go with Mitch. I'll go with Mitch. I don't feel great about it because I don't have I don't have a ton of confidence. I mean, look, if it's if again, it's like if Embiid was Embiid, we, different conversation. If Mitch was Mitch, this would be a different conversation. We don't know where he is right now. And when Mitch is not able to exert his will on a game in the way he's not able to exert his will on a game, his limitations, I think, shine through so much more. He's a very put stuff on the table, take stuff off the table sort of player. And there have been times when, since he's come back again, through no fault of his own, because he's he was out for months where the stuff that he takes off the table has been more, far more glaring than the stuff he, he brings to it. Um, he also helped win them a game. Um, if forget which, but where he was like dominant in the second half, uh, I'll go with Mitch and I'm going to hope for the best. That makes sense. That's like a good spot for Mitch. And feels I'm going right. to go with a similar guy who has shown incredible stuff in his career. Honestly, one of my favorite players to watch of his entire generation. I was thinking about I, it. I, I actually don't mean that. I'm totally serious. He's really one of my favorite players to watch. Of his he's a Hall of Famer. He's the most. He's the ultimate Tibbs guy who never played for Tibbs. <laughs> Shit, yeah. I know, I know that Tibbs has a love affair with him. 
He is Deuce McBride's favorite player. Is, is that a fact? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I had zero idea. Okay, you're breaking yeah. news here. Yeah, Deuce McBride loves Kyle Lowry. Uh, I believe he was R.J. Barrett's favorite player. I, I, I this is all news to me. Because R.J. grew up a rap. R.J. grew up a Raptors fan. That's right. So I think R.J. R.J. was a big Kyle Lowry fan. Look, I get it. He doesn't create offense the way that he used to. He's he been creates, pretty good for Philly. He creates fucking havoc, is what he creates. He creates fucking havoc that's exactly correct he is a master of chaos i mean even at the end of that sixers game last yes. night against the heat and the sixers can't inbound the ball because miami defends the inbounds perfectly and the sixers are just trying not to turn it over they have to call a timeout they can't inbound the ball again and kyle lowry frees himself so much so frantically he's about to fall freaking down and he <laughs> Ends up throwing a little pitch to save the play. Like, you talk about winning plays. The guy just has a history of doing that over and over. Yeah. And if I'm the Knicks, I'm like, like, he had a better season this year than he did last year. And if I'm the Knicks, what I'm like, I'm talking about Kyle Lowry leading into this series. Oh, I, I bet you. Hope so. Like knowing Tibbs, knowing his genuine love and appreciation for Kyle Lowry, I bet you they're they're talking about Kyle Lowry. Like I don't really know how much they're talking about like Paul Reed, but they're they may be talking about him now. They're talking about Kyle Lowry. It's just like, hey, Josh Hart, that guy is actually going to challenge you in terms of getting every single loose ball. So. Don't give it up. I mean, he's starting for them. He's shooting 40% from three. Yep. It's just, he, he didn't Decent have a great regular season him. last year. Yeah. He didn't have a great regular season last year. And then he comes out and he was great in that series against the Knicks. And part of the reason why Miami goes on that run last year is because he's coming off their bench and he's doing yep. a, a great job running their second I, unit. And all of a sudden it looks like Kyle Lowry running their second unit. I just, I'm not, I'm not writing off. I'm just not writing off Kyle Lowry. I'm just not doing it. That would be very extraordinarily silly. Um, a patron of Knicks Film School who will go unnamed made fun of me when I suggested that Kyle Lowry would have an impact on the Knicks Heat series last year. And, uh, oh, I, he, he had an impact. Uh, okay. I'm going to be continue to be hopeful. I'm worried about this guy, not because of anything he has done or not done this year, but um, he. The player I'm about to name has made one field goal in his postseason career. I forget exactly when it came last year, but it came at some point last year. I'm talking about Deuce McBride. I mean, RJ Barrett struggled in the playoffs at the start of his career. Emmanuel quickly struggled in the playoffs at the start of his career. Quentin Grimes struggled in the playoffs last year, uh, shooting wise, at least. Like, it's tough if you're a young player to get acclimated to this sort of stage. And this is like a lesser version of my thing about DiVincenzo is like Deuce McBride's threes have been so important. Like it, it why do every one of his threes feels like four points, you know? Cause it's like, man, they really needed that. It's just like, it, and he is going to need to make some of those. Um, I think if the Knicks are going to win the series, so I'm going to take him here and obviously his defense, we'll see how much of a chance he gets to defend against uh, t- um, Tyrus Maxey, but I am, I think he, that that I'm more confident. Like I don't. I think his his defense is going to be great whenever he gets a chance. Yeah, part of the reason why those threes seem so big is because they often come in the non Brunson minutes yes. when they really need a bucket. And if he can shoot really well, that can that can help them a lot. That's a good one. Uh, you took a guy who's made one shot in his in his playoff career. I'm going to take a guy who's made zero shots in his playoff career but has made a lot of shots in his non-playoff <laughs> career. Yes, he has. Buddy Heald, who I learned today, didn't even realize it, has never actually played in the playoffs before. It's but the it longest... The, isn't it, wasn't it the longest uh, streak or most games by any current player, or am I making that up? Might be. 
been around for a while. Maybe Andrew could look that up in the last couple of minutes that we have here. I think Heald had played in the most played in the most games of any player who has not played in the playoffs, but I'm not sure about that. He he can just go off. Hey, I mean, look, it, you, take your pick, him or Boyan Bogdanovic. They're the same category to me. Oh, yeah. Both of them, both of them, they could be like either of them could just come off the bench, hit three threes in three minutes, and you're like, damn, that dude just won his team the game. He just he, he that 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 dude just hit five threes in the blink of an eye. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. And either of them can do that, but healed is like Buddy Healds is a really, I think, underrated shooter. I I I, I think he's an extremely underrated shooter. I don't think people look at him and don't think of him as a great shooter, but he's like a generationally great shooter. Oh, like he's not the same level as Boyan Bogdanovich, who's a great shooter, but he's a generationally great three point shooter. He moves off the ball. He's so dangerous. You can never lose him. He's got range for days. You got to guard him way past the three point arc. He is, he's madness. I liked that pickup for them. And he's, He's been solid coming off their bench. And I look, Buddy Heald goes for 23 one game or something. There's Philly wins fun. by by four. Like yeah. that, that, that could easily happen. Um, he is in ter- in terms of three point field goals, he is 10th active amongst active players. And again, he's not that old. Um, although I'd be curious to see where his career goes from. From here, if he, I don't think he's ever starting any place ever again, but we'll see. Um, 22nd career. Um, Andrew confirms healed was the most act, what most games by an active player without playoff appearance, 632. And now it's Lori Markinen with 403, followed by Miles Bridges, Colin Sexton, and Chris, Christian Wood, of course. Christian Wood. Um, okay. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a fine pick. I would I have gone with healed there. I don't know what I would have if I would have gone with healed there. I might have gone with bogey over healed. So I'll go with bogey here. Um, it's kind of crazy that he's the what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's the fifteenth pick. These are good teams, John. I know this is I, not a normal first round series. This if is, you didn't hear, yeah. the Knicks should have intentionally lost. He yes. ducked the Sixers. If, These I, are I, good. These are freaking good teams. I think whoever wins this series is going to go to the conference finals. I, I, I think I agree with you. I want to see the series play out first. Um, but yeah, no, I, I more just mean from a perspective of when they traded for Bogdanovich, I was like, I, as as you, I'm sure you know, I was kind of over the moon about the impact that he would have. Just and I think I got a little, little ahead of myself. Can he still have a big impact? Absolutely, and he has been obviously uh, better of late. And has helped them win win games. Uh, he maybe he'll need to help them win a game or two here. Um, I wonder though. He is the first guy that has been drafted that I wonder like if he has a rough first half. I mean, I don't even have to wonder. Tibbs already did it because he had a rough first half in a big game and he didn't get off the bench. And I could see that happening easily in the playoffs. So, uh, but I will hope for not many of those. And yeah, Bogdanovich. Could easily see that. I I could see Tibbs going eight man rotation first half and seven man rotation second half. Like I could see that not like like just right off the bat. Easily. Why not? Um, I think I think we should do I let's do three more total picks unless you want to go beyond that because I don't I think we should just draft the like the like the players who are at least have a decent shot to see the court. Um, unless you think we should keep going. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I kind of thought this would be the last pick. Oh, I, I want. I think we should do one more pick after this. So who, who's? Okay. I'm assuming you're going to take Paul Reed here. I am going to take Paul Reed. Okay. Bullets. Do I need to wax here. about Paul Reed? Please, God, don't. I mean, Sixers Twitter would love it. Six Sixers. Paul Reed is to Sixers fans what like Obi Toppin was to Knicks fans. Huh. They love. They love. Some Paul Reed. And and I will say, Paul Reed is my favorite jump shot in the NBA. <laughs> it goes in. It's my, fa- 
Yeah, it does go in. It's my it favorite jump shot. It's my it favorite in. jump shooting form. It's it's phenomenal. It's miles ahead of like Tyrese Halliburton's jump shot. It, it is my is my favorite jump shot in the whole league. It's fantastic. I love it. I'm pretty convinced that if I just poked him with my pinky, he'd fall over while he was taking it. And it goes in and I just I just love it. And he's he honestly is a, a solid player. And by the way, here's the way he can really have an impact if Joel Embiid leaves a game or whatever yeah. because he's not you know, if Embiid is is either gets hurt and leaves and comes back or is out for the rest of the game or whatever, or the knee is acting up and he's on a restriction. It's like, you just, you can't play him more than 30 minutes. Like you're going to need 18 minutes out of Paul Reed. Yeah. I mean, look, the, 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 uh, skeleton crew Sixers without forget about without Embiid, without Maxi beat the Knicks in that absolutely dreadful game that what was it 79 73 and Paul Reed made some some plays in that game. Um I I want to go one more round because I want to take Precious because I think for as much as I was uh hopefully optimistic about Mitchell Robinson earlier, I think Precious Achua is going to get minutes in the series. I think he'll get minutes at some point in time at the 5. I would actually be mildly surprised if there was not a game whether it's because of foul trouble or because Mitch just like wasn't effective um that Precious Achua did not see time and uh so I I, I that's why I wanted one more pick. Okay. Well, I'll round it out with Cameron Payne. There you go. Speaking of jump shots. Made a big three, a corner three the other night. That's a, every, I mean, every three in that game felt big. Well, they go in. His form is just hilarious. It's like, yeah. you know, his shoulders all the way to the side and it's great. Yeah. I love, um, I love weird jump shooting for him. Clearly, I never knew that was an obsession of yours, but now, now hey, I'm, it's in character. It's, it's in character. Yes, <laughs> it is a character. All right, uh, we've done we've done the thing, and we did it in about an hour, which is good. Um, I don't know any final thoughts before we get out of here. My list was very similar to yours. Okay, like we were basically within one pick on everything. Same. Mine was, same goes to you. Yeah. Yeah. My mine was mine was really really. Similar to yours, John. Do you have you an X factor? What's that? Do I have an oh. X factor? Yeah, I think my X factor is probably Mitchell Robinson. Just really? because, yeah. Wow. Just okay. because, just because I think the largest disparity between what this guy is actually capable of being and what he's been lately belongs to him. Okay. Uh, you know, it's 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 his conditioning more so than his health. He's not hurt. He's just heavy and tired, which we can all relate to. And he's had a week between games. Yep. And if they're just like, Mitch, don't even practice. You're on the treadmill the whole damn time. You could be tired from being on the treadmill the whole damn time. But here's the deal. Here's the diet plan. Like maybe a, a week of just conditioning could be good for him. And I'm not saying he's going to get to the point where he was playing like he was at the beginning of the year when he's grabbing six offensive rebounds in games and he's playing it legitimately in all defense level. But if he can get back to a decent level of that, oh, Wow. Well, that's like that's that's the the Knicks have forty eight minutes of the best center defense in the NBA, if that's the case, and all of a sudden, by the way, scoring without Brunson on the floor becomes less of an issue. Not because you're going to score more, but because you're just not really going to give up points with OG oh. and Obi staggered with the bench unit, and Mitch potentially with the bench unit. But the offensive uh, rebounding could could help them in that respect. The offensive for rebounding sure. could help them for sure, and and. There will be a game where Hartenstein gets in foul trouble. Yeah. There will be a game where Embiid is torching Hartenstein. And it gives you different looks. You can throw at him. There will be a game where Hartenstein is just not playing well. And it gives you different looks you can throw at him. So I would, I would probably say, I think I'd, I think I'd say Mitch. And then uh, Andrew's typing in the chat, Fred, make a prediction. I, I don't know. Do you feel comfortable making a prediction? Yeah. My prediction is that I will not become internet famous for anybody who I drafted today. Like Dean Wade. That's a great prediction. Uh, I will also say Nixon seven. 
I think it's, I, I would say I you're a good company, but I don't know if you would agree with that. I I think it's I think it's going to be a really hard fought series. I think it's going to be a good series. I think it will probably be the most fun series in the first round in the East. I'm in the East. I yeah, I mean, there's some great West series. We I'm really we excited about for Mavs. Your pod. Yeah, yeah, really excited for Mavs Clippers. That's yeah. that that has the potential to be awesome. But by the way, John was on my pod earlier this week. So you can check that out. But yeah, I think I'm going to say Knicks and seven. I just, Embiid doesn't look all the way healthy. And I, I wonder how he's going to trek through a series. Uh, I don't think it's going to be an easy win for them, but I think the Knicks, if we like gun to my head, I would have the Knicks going to the conference finals. Cause I think whoever wins this series, if they come out of it healthy, I think, or, you know, reasonably healthy. Yeah. I think whoever wins this series should be the favorite against Milwaukee or Indiana. So. I, I will, I'll think about that when the time comes. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're both Knicks and seven. Um, we'll see. I agree. It's going to be a hard, hard fought series and uh, it will not be easy uh, for, for either team to win. Cause I don't think these teams are going to make it easy on each other uh, in part because we haven't mentioned either of the coaches. These are really, these are two really good coaches. Um, Super good coaches. Yeah. So like this is going to be a well coached series. That's what I was saying before. Like I love, I love the chess match. This will be a very well coached series yeah. Two two really good tacticians, like, like two like, like X's and O's guys with like real identities too, <laughs> you know? Like, like, like Billy Donovan, I think is a good coach, but he's kind of a chameleon, you yeah. know, like he is going to play to his personnel every single year. You can't really look at a team and be like, that's a Billy Donovan team, uh, but you can look at a Tibbs team and you're like, that's a Dibs team. Yeah. And you could look at a Nick nurse team. And be like, that's a Nick nurse team, you know? And, and that kind of stuff's fun. Like you can look at a Spo team and you're like, that's a oh. Spo team. You know, like a the coaches who instill these identities in their teams. And uh, yeah, I, I think, I think that'll be really fun. I'm really excited to ask Tibbs about all the X's and O's of the series and for Tibbs to not answer them. I'm really excited. It's going to be fun. Interesting the question you ask. <laughs> it's gonna be he's great. really good at that. Um, he, he's really good at that. And you are very good at what you do, Fred Katz. Of The Athletic, go read um, everything Fred writes. I'm excited to read his coverage of the series. Um, cause it'll help inform, uh, my opinion of it certainly. And also, um, listen to Fred Katz on cats and shoot, um, which do you, are you, oh yeah, you could say who, cause the episode will have already dropped. So you want to say who, who's on the latest, the shoot episode? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be a secret anyway. Yeah. I just, I just before this recorded, uh, a series preview with Gina Mizell covers the Sixers for the Philly Inquirer. She was great. And, uh, we really just talked Nick Sixers series the whole time. We, Talked Jalen Brunson for a while. We talked Embiid. We talked guarding Embiid. We talked guarding Brunson. We talked X Factors and Sixers narrative stuff. And we oh, talked okay. about our That's least exciting. favorite. We talked about a, this disastrous national anthem that happened at a Nick 76ers game earlier this year. It was it was great. So go check that out. Cats and shoot. Patreon.com slash cats and shoot. It was a well executed uh, plug. Uh, and so thank you, Fred. Thank you, Andrew, for producing. And can I also say, yes, I'll have a preview up on the Athletic tomorrow. Serious preview. So check oh, out like Friday a full morning. preview. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a story for Thursday morning on guarding Embiid. I had a story for Tuesday morning on OG Ananobi's a specific type of off ball cutting that's going to be really important. For OG and Anobi in the playoffs, I had a story on guarding and beef for Thursday, and then I'm going to have like a full on series preview for Friday morning. So check that out on the athletic. Excited for that. Definitely check that out. Read everything Fred writes. Um, so uh, you will be more uh, informed as a basketball fan, and you will also enjoy it too because you get to read words like shant. Uh, <laughs> and I, I shant belabor the point anymore. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Andrew Claudio, for producing this episode. And thank you out there for listening. Uh, hopefully you shan't have any regrets about your choice today. And we'll be back with more fun and games before you know it. Peace out.
Peace out. Peace out. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>